So how many people know someone with autism? Okay, I think I've just about seen, not quite everyone, but just about seen everyone's hand go up. Um, um, unlike our advertising budget, it appears. Uh, <laughs> um, but the reason that is, is because the latest numbers for the Center for Disease Control, or the CDC, show that one out of 59 individuals has autism. And so whether or not you realize it, you probably do know someone or even many people who have autism. With this, though, it's uh, one of the mysteries of the brain uh, in terms of what causes autism. And so we're going to use genetics tonight as an example of how we might get some insight. I'm not saying that everything is genetically determined, but that's what the theme of my talk tonight is going to be. Now, when we think about autism, though, it's a very wide spectrum. And so it, in fact, goes by the title of Autism Spectrum Disorder because it does have that spectrum. At the one end of the spectrum, you can have individuals that are really uh, impaired in one sense, in the sense that they could be nonverbal. They may not be able to speak. They may have significant other things going on in their brain, like seizures or epilepsy. Um, they may have other medical problems. Um, in some cases, they may have self-injurious behaviors, that is, things where they're doing headbanging or things where they might scratch themselves um, or things that could be really quite troubling. So that's at one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you have individuals that are just incredible. Incredible in the sense that they really do see the world and see problems through a different view. And in fact, they bring that perspective in terms of being able to problem solve and be able to think about approaches that are really quite novel. And so if any of you know folks that are at that end of the spectrum, it really can be quite enlightening in terms of seeing how they can do some things. People will call them savants in some cases or some ways. Uh, but what unifies everyone on the spectrum is that they do have challenges that are similar in the sense that they have difficulty in terms of social communication, social interactions with other folks. They find that difficult. They may have problems where they feel safer when things feel the same. So they have a same, they had a, have sort of a need for things being consistent, expected. They're more comfortable that way. They can get anxious when suddenly things change or get uh, they get a curveball. Um, and some individuals may have particular sensitivities. They may get sensory overload. So anything from a tag on a shirt that bothers them to noises that are too loud and they feel that they really need to cover their ears or wear headphones or even go to a quieter place that's not so overwhelming. So with that, there's a very wide spectrum. And one of the challenges in the field is that we call it all the same. We call it autism, or people have sometimes used the term Asperger syndrome for people at the quote unquote milder end of the spectrum. Um, but with that, it sometimes gets confusing because you're talking about a very heterogeneous condition. And some people will say, if you've met one person with autism, you've met exactly one person with autism, that there are really many, many different, uh, if you will, uh, varieties on the theme with this, wonderful varieties. With this, uh, I've shown here that there are some additional, either people think about them as associated conditions, and the key is not everyone with autism has all of those dimensions. They have some number of them, but not necessarily all of them. So I mentioned a couple in terms of being gifted or having epilepsy, but there are even some issues in terms of intestinal issues. So people can have issues in terms of particular sensitivities to food. They may have constipation. They may have diarrhea. Some cases that can actually be quite upsetting. Um, in some cases, they have difficulty with sleep. And so as an example, um, there are some people that have very disrupted sleep. They may sleep for two or three hours, but they won't get a solid eight hours of sleep during the night. Some people, it actually changes over the course of their lifetime. So they have one set of issues when they're little itty bitty. And I think one of the challenges many of us are appreciating is that as these individuals are aging up, as they're getting to be adolescents, adults, uh, young adults, and older adults, again, those, those challenges can change over the life course. So with that, um, this is, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And as a result of that, as researchers, as researchers have tried to study it, uh, to be honest, they've had a lot of trouble making progress. Because they would take, say, relatively, they thought they were large studies, but there might be 20 individuals with autism. They do some sort of study, looking at the brain, doing imaging, doing EEGs, doing tasks that they would do, uh, which now amount to games on an iPad. But they would do those things in terms of seeing how the brain worked. Then some other group would take another 20 people, try and repeat it by doing those same tasks, the same MRIs, the same EEGs, and they get radically different results. 
And you ask yourself why? Well, it's not surprising. These are many, many different conditions. They're not really studying the same condition either one time to another. And so as a result, there's been a lot of difficulty scientifically with what we call rigor and reproducibility. Things have not replicated. We haven't seen the same thing again. And it's hard to know then what's actually the fact, what's going on with the brain. We do this all in terms of trying to understand this better because individuals have challenges. I'm not saying that you know, individuals want to be cured necessarily of these challenges, but they have challenges and they want supports. They want to be able to have a better quality of life. And to do that, we need to understand how the brain's working to be able to support that. And I'll get to some of those opportunities at the end. With this, uh, if you think about what I talked about in terms of some of those characteristics, take just the characteristic of sociability, right? So if you think about all of us in this room, if I were to have some sort of quantitative measure of this, in fact, some of you are social butterflies. You're really, really adept at being able to make friends and being able to have conversations uh, over drinks. You were probably uh, having cocktail conversation about many different things. Others of you might not feel so comfortable with that. You'd rather be able to be in your safe zone. Um, and maybe you have a few close friends, but maybe not the most gregarious person. I would actually posit uh, that when we think about something like this, there's an entire spectrum that even goes beyond the official diagnosis of autism. That when we think about this as a continuous measure rather than a categorical measure, there are many, many different individuals along that spectrum. We, from a medical point of view, have medicalized this to a certain degree, and being able to say above a certain threshold, you officially meet the criteria for autism. If you're just on the other side of the line, you might be shy, but you might not officially have a psychological or psychiatric diagnosis. The reason I say this is because, to me, these are just differences. We're all different. If we were all the same, how boring would we be, right? So we're all different, and we want to celebrate those differences. But again, we want to be able to support people with those challenges. So I see patients every Monday, or almost every Monday. And when I do, families come in to me, and they ask a question, which is an obvious question, but they ask me why. So they actually don't usually come to me asking if, Someone else usually answers the question if their child or their family member has autism. But once they've gotten that diagnosis, they come to me and they say, Dr. Wendy, why? What caused this? And I will say for the women out there, many of the women, if they, even if they don't say it out loud, will ask themselves, did I do something that caused this? Right? Was there something I did during the pregnancy? Was there something I did when my child was young? Was there something that I did that caused this? And, and I have to say, there's, I think, a lot of baggage that goes with that. Um, sometimes people will ask because they'll say, we want to be able to know something about the future. We want some information about prognosis. And most people say we want something, if there's going to be something that's going to help, we want to be able to figure out which type of autism this might be and if there's something we can get guidance for. And so I'm going to talk a lot about that. The bottom line is for any one person that I see in terms of identifying a cause, I can come up with the answer these days about 20% of the time. That's the good news, bad news. So you can now, that's the take home message. You can go home now if you're bored. Um, so with that though, that means 80% of the time we have not yet figured this out. It's not all about the genes, but for the majority of individuals where we can pin it down to one thing, it is in the genes, but we know there are other factors from epidemiological studies, which I won't have time to talk about. We do know that there are infections during pregnancy. We know there are infections in early childhood that can cause this. Um, whether it's the virus itself or whatever might be infected, whether it's some of the inflammatory response or what we do to fight the infection, it could be some of both. Um, there may be things are in our environment, so things that we're exposed to, things like pollutants, chemicals, things that are changing in that. Um, but we don't know all the answers is the bottom line. We do know some about the genetics, though, and I'll talk a little bit about that. One of the fundamental genetic things, though, is our sex. So in terms of this, uh, there is a gender discrepancy between males and females with autism. So overall, we see approximately four males to every one female who has autism. And so that's been one of the conundrums. Why should there be such a difference between men and women or between boys and girls in terms of this? I'm going to throw out a radical idea on this um, and that I don't know that it's actually so different. I will tell you there's an interesting sociological thing within the community for any of you who know or have ever been to autism providers. They look more like me than they look like some of you guys out there. 
emphasis on guys. So what I mean by that is that many of the providers that actually deal with individuals and make the diagnosis of autism are psychologists, developmental pediatricians, behaviorists, psychiatrists, but they tend to be much more predominated by women in the field than they do by men. I think a lot of what this is is we recognize as women what we think of as normal behavior, and when we see guys, no offense, but some of the behaviors you guys have, they might not feel as normal to us, and I do think <laughs> they get labeled sometimes as being pathologic, and I think some of it is not so pathologic, it's just differences, but anyway, that's my, that's my perspective on this, and people can argue with me. Uh, but there are some that are truly different. Um, there are also differences between boys and girls. Uh, for those of you who have children, I have sons. They tend to act out a lot more. I can, they externalize. I can see their feelings uh, because they'll have some explosions like we did tonight at home, I heard. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and females in general, not always, but in general, they may keep it bottled up. They may be internalizing and they may have problems that manifest more in terms of anxiety, depression, not feeling so good about themselves, but you may not physically see it on the outside. And as a result, who comes to attention in the family, in the classroom, um, it's more oftentimes the boys than the girls. So just keep that in mind as we go through. Okay, so what gives me the right to talk about genetics? As a geneticist, uh, why should you now pay attention to the next 30 or so minutes? Um, well, there's a simple experiment that we do, and we look naturally at what we see in families. So one thing that happens just naturally sometimes is that we have identical twins. So identical or monozygotic twins, uh, they literally are genetically almost always 100% identical, if not 100%, very, very close to that. Uh, they share the same intrauterine environment, so we can keep that part constant. They also, because as uh, parents, we sometimes dress them up the same and keep them the same in the same bedroom and other things, they actually share a lot the same postnatal environment as well. And so they, they are pretty good experiments, if you will, uh, clones or carbon copies. Now what's interesting is if you take two identical twins and you ask yourself, if one twin has autism, what's the probability that the other twin has autism? If this were genetic, if it were entirely genetic, what would you think that answer should be? 100%, absolutely. Is that number up there 100%? Absolutely not. 77%, some people have estimated 80%. But it's not 100%. So there's some difference that not, at least not in the genes that happened right at the time of fertilization, but there's some change, some difference between the two of them. That number is high though. So as an example, as a comparison now, if you take fraternal twins, right? So these are cases that are like brother and sister, but they share the same in utero environment. They can be in the same household. They share the same, share the same some of the same uh, postnatal factors. Now, if you look at that, they share 50% of their genomes or 50% of their genetic information. The, the concordance rate between those is 31%. But now take as an interesting comparator to that siblings. So these are, again, genetically sharing 50% of their genetic information, but they don't share the same in utero environment. They don't necessarily share the same exposures after they're born. And in that particular case, it's lower. Right, statistically significantly lower, only 20% in those cases. And in the general population, as you've heard, it's about 1% or these days one in 59 individuals with autism. So what does that tell me? What that tells me is there are some genes. Gen I don't, that doesn't tell me what the genes are, but it tells me genes are important in that, but it's not all in the genes, right? Part of it's genes, part of it's something else. So that gives us sort of a general reason why we should be thinking about that. Okay. So with that, there's been an explosion, something called the Human Genome Project. So the year I started medical school was the year we started the Human Genome Project. Uh, luckily, as I say, it finished ahead of schedule, I finished ahead of schedule, and it's now many years later, uh, but we're now able to sequence a genome. The first genome that we sequenced, the first human genome we sequenced, anyone want to guess how much did it cost us? By the way, as taxpayers, this cost us a lot. That's a good, that's a good number. Anyone want to quantify what that lot is? Uh, 100 million? A billion. Three billion dollars, right? That first genome, it was complete exploration, discovery. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, $3 billion for us to be able to do that. Okay, the last genome that I sequenced, how much do you think that cost me? 1000 
Very good, very good guess. A little, I got a bargain price, so I'm a little bit less than that, $999. Um, <laughs> but basically, you're right. So the cost of sequencing has come down tremendously. We still don't understand what it all means, but at least to be able to generate the data, I could have any one of you tonight spit in a cup. Within a couple days, we could have your genome sequenced, and it would take us a little a while, but we could start to interpret that information. With the ability to do that came the following question, which for the first time we could answer about five, six years ago, and it was the following. So we did know that for some individuals, takes an individual with autism, especially who's at that severe end that I talked to you about. So someone, for instance, who's not talking, who's not likely to be living independently, many of those families come to see me and they have no family history. They come to me and their folks say, uh, Dr. Chung, you're very nice, but we have clean genes in our family. This can't be a genetic thing, okay? So, but think, that, think about this now, think about this as a population geneticist for a second. So if you have an individual who's severely impaired, who's probably not gonna get married, not gonna have children, not gonna reproduce, um, where did those genes come from? They're not gonna get passed down to the next generation, so how did they come up in the first place? And so folks that were very smart, um, one in particular, Mike Wiggler and his group, uh, thought about this and they had this radical idea. They thought about, well, maybe some of these genetic changes are actually new. They start out and they're actually new with each generation. So within your genome, you have three billion letters. It cost us basically a dollar per base pair when we were doing the sequence. So you've got three billion letters. I can admit I have done this own experiment on my own children. I think they forgive me for this. Uh, but as we've done this, we have looked and we've taken my husband, we've taken myself, we've looked at my sons, and we've seen how often do you see new genetic changes in children that you don't see in either parent? Anyone wanna guess about what that number is? What's, what's the guess? 50, not a bad guess. So uh, on average, it's somewhere between 100 and 150, so you're very close. So within this, in most of those cases, those genetic changes fall in places that don't matter, and that's why we look as good as we do, right? <laughs> Every once in a while though, and if you take all newborns as an example, every once in a while, about one to 2% of those newborns though, one of those changes will fall in a place where it actually makes a big difference, not just for autism, but for many other conditions as well. So the experiment we were able to do once we got the cost of genome sequencing down was to do the experiment I just told you about. We could take individuals, families with autism, we could take mom, we could take dad, we could take the child with autism and sequence their entire genomes and do a relatively simple analysis where we just said what's new in the child with autism that we don't see in mom and dad. And by doing that type of experiment, we could see that everyone has de novo changes, they occur in many places, and that for approximately, conservatively, 20% of the individuals with autism, those new genetic changes are the, capital V, T-H-E, cause of their autism. Okay, I'm gonna get into that in just a second, but it means there's one genetic factor. Now that was still an expensive experiment, and so this is what we, we, we decided we wanted to do some shortcuts, we wanted to use some cost-saving analyses, and so this is what your genome looks like, Take a second to stare at that. I know it's a <laughs> bit confusing at the end of a long day, but let me help you out a little bit. If I show you or highlight certain portions of this, the way your genome is organized is that it has little gold nuggets. These are the regions that code for the proteins in our body. They compose about 1.5% of the genome, and they're little gold nuggets that we have to cut and sew and paste together but we can actually skip over a lot of the stuff that we don't understand, the 98% or so what we don't understand, and focus on those gold nuggets. And that actually now decreases our cost of sequencing analysis tremendously, and it's a shortcut that we often take. For those of you who have taken high school biology recently, we call those little gold nuggets exons, and when we put them all together across the genome, we call it an exome, because we like putting ohm at the end of everything. <laughs> And with that, we can be able to take that shortcut, and literally at this point, we have sequenced now tens of thousands of individuals with autism and their families using this exome analysis. Now, as we've done this, and again, this is gonna be uh, one of the harder slides, but don't worry about it if you zone out for a couple seconds. Uh, as I said, many of us have these changes. We all, in fact, have these changes, but many of these changes don't change anything in our protein. They are called synonymous. So if we look at the individuals with autism in red, uh, the siblings that don't have autism in green, you can see that for those changes that don't affect the protein, 
equal frequency. That's not what's special, that's not what's different. On the other hand, if you start taking some of these changes that are, we call nonsense changes, they make the protein into nonsense, they cause splicing problems or that cutting and pasting that I talked about, putting those gold nuggets together. If we look at all of those together, there's statistically significantly an increased frequency in red for any of those bars in the individual with autism. So where the money is, where the difference are, are those particular changes. So as we did this, and as we started making some calculations, we figured out that of those de novo genetic changes, we estimate, and this is just an estimate at this point, that there are at least 400 different genes that are causing autism. Now what I mean by this, are these are genetic. <laughs> so these are genes where one and only one gene, and only changes within that one gene deterministically will tell if that person has autism. Those are powerful genes, and they tend to be for individuals who are at that severe end of the spectrum. On the other hand, as I'll show you in a second, there are things that are genetic. So some of these changes, so shown on the left, that big blue box is the one that's the really powerful gene. On the other hand, there are other things that are little itty bitty genetic changes. Itty bitty genetic changes we all have, we're not special, but it's the aggregation or the constellation of many, many, many of those little genetic changes in just the right combination that for some individuals will make their personality and make their brain work as an individual with autism. Those type of genetic changes tend to be for individuals who are at the milder end of the spectrum. So we do see that they're genetic, but they're different types of genes and different types of impact. Now in reality for anyone, you oftentimes have a combination of these, that for some individuals they may have some stronger genes, but also some things that might mitigate it that are some of those weaker genes. Other individuals might have some intermediate genes, but at the end of the day, we're a combination of all these things that will determine exactly how our brain is working and how that's manifesting. One of the things I'll say is that of those 400 different genes that we estimate, as of this morning, we know of about 80 of them that we can be confident of. So we still have a long way to go to be able to understand that. For some of you that really wanna know about genetics, I'll give you a whole lot about in terms of how we can find those additional genes. But just to say, we've made a significant amount of progress, but we're not anywhere close to being done. So in fact, some mathematicians did some calculations to figure out how close we would need, how, how far we would have to go to get to the point where we could start identifying now those 400 or so genes, much less probably another 400 different genes that are involved in those milder forms of autism. And as we did those power calculations, we figured out that we needed to study about 50,000 families with autism to be able to get to some of those answers. And so for some of you, 50,000 might seem like, eh, not a big deal. Uh, 50,000 to me as a researcher sounded like a big deal, uh, but I was not daunted by this. I said, we'll, we'll have a way of getting there. So I'm gonna show you, share with you in a little bit exactly how we got there. So you might ask yourself, well, with all of these different genes, what can you learn, what can you understand about those genes and how the brain's working? Eventually, that's what we wanna get to, right? We wanna be able to have some anchors, some pillars to understand what's different about the brains for individuals with autism, and if we need to, how can we modify or how can we support that? So as we've done this, we have about 20,000 genes in our genome. And again, we've got about 80 of these that we know so far with autism. This was not just a random walk through the genome. So these were not randomly that we saw these. We are starting to see some convergence or some way in which we're seeing patterns in terms of what genes are important. So brain cells talk to each other, neurons talk to each other through synapses, through connections. In fact, one of the things that perhaps is not surprising is many of those proteins at the synapse are the genes that we see in autism, those same genes that are controlling that, talking to each other and making those connections. We also importantly see though that there are uh, proteins and what we call transcription factors um, that I call conductors. So as the brain, as the body is developing, it needs a pattern, it needs a blueprint, and it needs someone who's actually coordinating that all, who's a conductor. And many of those genes that we see that are involved are genes that are involved in that orchestration, being able to make sure just amount enough of the woodwinds over here, not too much of the percussion over here, and having the brass come up. So that coordination, that timing of development, very important as we see in the brain. And the brain in particular is very sensitive to perturbations. As you can imagine, it's remarkable what we do every day in terms of with our brain. And if we tweak anything just a little bit off, we can actually see that as a manifestation of brain function and behavior. Thank you. 
With all of this, though, we realize that we're not nearly done. And one of the things that perhaps was surprising to some, not so much to me because I also study other parts of the body, um, but surprising to some was that there was some convergence, not just with the way the brain works, but in fact the way the rest of the body works. So I remember very, very characteristically um, as a scientist at doing a lot of team sports, we have a lot of team meetings. And I remember I had a team meeting at 9 o'clock about autism, and we looked at our autism genes. And then I had another team meeting with my team on congenital heart disease, also studying our congenital heart disease meetings at noon. And I said, I should have had a V8. I swear I just was at the same meeting from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Um, and that was five years ago, but it was our first realization that, in fact, there was this convergence. Some of those same genes that were the conductors that were you know, helping the orchestra to perform correctly, they were not just involving the patterning of the brain, but they were also involved in the patterning of the heart. And to a certain extent, they're involved in patterning of other parts of the body or development. We also see, perhaps not surprisingly, that some of the genes we see for autism, we can also see in individuals that have developmental delays or intellectual disabilities, other individuals who have epilepsy or seizure, and perhaps other individuals who have things like schizophrenia. The different changes in those genes, the different exact typo that we see, or in fact some of the rest of those genes or how a person is brought up may cause some of the differences or be some of the, responsible for some of the differences why the same gene may manifest as one versus the other. So with this, we decided, as I said, that we needed to get about 50,000 families together. And so we embarked about two and a half years ago on a mission um, that was a little bit, uh, I don't know, kind of different from the way scientists oftentimes do things. It started with the premise that I believe in people. I believe in our families. I believe in our families with autism, especially that, number one, they understand their child or they understand their family member with autism. I trust them with that. Um, they wouldn't make this stuff up. Uh, that's number one. And number two, that there were people who wanted to participate in research, but they just didn't have access. They didn't know how to do it. They wanted. And number three, that they were busy. I think we're all really busy. And so we had to find ways to be able to help people participate. And we did this because we needed to have individuals able to do the research to make sure that we actually knew how the brain was working, that we could do it reproducibly and robustly. So we did this with a program called SPARC that you heard about before. Um, the only eligibility criteria for this was that you had to live in the United States, um, and you had to have what we call a professional diagnosis of autism. So someone besides you, yourself uh, had to tell you or, or your child that you had autism. And with that, we did this as an online way of being able to sign up or signing up at one of our clinical sites around the country. We've got 25 wonderful clinical sites around the country. Uh, we've got one in Houston at Baylor College of Medicine, and perhaps we'll have more coming on board. Uh, but as we did this, we allowed everyone, as I said, to be able to sign up online in about 20 minutes. So relatively simply, uh, we actually chart these things. I can tell you most people do it, I think, probably in their jammies after dinner, because um, they're doing it mostly in the evening and on the weekend. Surprise, surprise, um, but doing it from their convenience of their home. And after about two and a half years, uh, I'm very pleased to say that even though our original goal was 50,000, we now have all told with all our family members about 138,000 individuals. Um, and of this, we've already hit our goal of over 50,000 individuals with autism. But now I'm an overachiever. I've decided we're not just doing 50,000. We're going to go well beyond that. Um, as we're doing it, nicely you can see they're spread out around the country, basically where people live around the country. And, and as we did this, one of the premises is that we're on this journey together. We need to learn together. Uh, we need to, we as researchers need to le learn from you as individuals and families with autism. And reciprocally, as we're learning, we need to give this information back to you. So we give it back to you in two ways. Number one is we give it back to you as an individual. So if we learn something about your behavior, about your genetics, we give that information back to you. Um, and if we learn something as a group about individuals with autism, we give that back to the community as a whole. And so We've set up a series of doing this with WebExes, webinars, um, in terms of doing that with uh, brochures about this, and with individual test reports that we make very accessible, very understandable, that you can then take to your doctor or your teacher uh, and be able to use this information. And as we do this, we have a program that we call Research Match, where any researchers around the country can be able to say, I've got this particular study with autism. They can describe it to their community, and we can send out basically an email that says, this is an invitation, this is the opportunity. You don't have to do it, but here it is. It's right in your backyard. You're eligible. Um, and if you'd like to do it, here's where you can sign up for this. 
Um, with this, as we've done this, we've had investigators do all sorts of interesting things, some, some I didn't even predict. And all of this we make completely freely available to the community so it doesn't cost researchers a cent to do this. We've had people that looked at twins. I talked about twins before, so we've had people take a deep dive in twins. Uh, we've had some that look at the younger siblings from the time of birth or even sometimes before the time of birth to be able to see what are the early factors that may affect whether or not another family member gets autism, be able to do some very interesting studies that we call baby sibs, um, and then various different things. Some that have looked at moms and gotten data about what they were exposed to during the pregnancy, some that were things in terms of how to deal with uh, sleep and some sleep issues, but all sorts of different uh, things that people have, are now studying to do with this. Um, one of the remarkable things to me is just how engaged the community has been with this. And I think it's a real testament to the families who have done this. Um, these are individual researchers who have done online studies. And these individuals have all been able to reach the recruitment milestones within a few weeks of what they were doing. And as you can see from the numbers, in some cases, this was with thousands of families and participation rates greater than 60 or 70%. And so for us, this is actually a very efficient way of being able to do research. And we hope that with this, we can iterate much, much faster. We can learn, we can ask new questions, we can answer questions, and we can keep moving forward at a much faster rate. Um, with this, we also have what we call clinical trials or things that may be able to test out and see if some new, whether it's a behavioral method, whether it's a medication, uh, but something in terms of seeing how effective it is. That's understandably not been as exciting for people to try experimental medications. I totally understand and get that. It's a much bigger commitment in terms of this. There might be risks associated with it. But even still, you can see that with many individuals, they're able to reach their, reach their recruitment milestones, which I think is important. Um, with this, we've been doing, as I talked about, that exome sequencing. So with our participants, if they would like to participate in the genetic portion of this, there's no obligation, but if they would, they spit in a cup, literally. They send that in. We can extract the DNA from that saliva sample, and then we can do that exome sequencing that I talked about. So we can look at their genetic information, and we look at it specifically looking to see if we can find any genetic causes of autism, and specifically some of those de novo or new genetic events. So we've done this for our first set of families. We got a huge rush of data on about 30,000 individuals just a couple weeks ago. And as we've been doing that, we've realized that they're just immediately jumping out at us about 11% of individuals that clearly have now a genetic cause of autism that we can return to them. So let me give you a flavor, a, a sort of sense of some of the different variability. So in this, these are two different genes that we saw just in the last few weeks. Um, one of them is a gene called BRSK2, not that you really are, are so worried about that, but that has a certain profile that goes with it, and that profile is at the severe end. Those individuals have a lot of challenges in terms of intellectual disabilities, they're nonverbal, they have uh, more severe, if you will, autism. We then found another gene, and statistically, both of these were very significant, ITSN1. And interestingly enough, this is one of those sort of intermediate genes. It, it has a profile definitely associated with it where individuals are verbal. They tend to have a lot of independent self-help skills, but yet they have more of these challenges in terms of the sociability. And they do have a little bit in terms of some of the problems, um, needing special education, need some help in school. But they're in that intermediate zone. And I think as we go through this, we're going to be seeing all all sorts of shades of gray in between. Um, but I think there are going to be different profiles with different genes. Um, as I talked about, this is now about 11% of our families. Some of these we see that are de novo genetic events. We do see some that are inherited events as well. So there, there are some examples where they're coming from parents. Um, and in some of those cases, the parents don't have autism, but they may have other different challenges, um, some other behavioral issues. So with this, uh, it's been interesting. I actually have had the joy of being able to talk with many of the families to give them this information. And I've been learning from them about what this information means. How do they use it? How is it helpful? How is it not helpful? Um, and as they've done it, one of the things that we've underscored is that um, it differs a little bit depending on the age of the person. So individuals, for instance, who have little bitty children, you can imagine this information gives a lot of prognostic information that you didn't know. You didn't know necessarily if or when your child was going to be talking or where they were going to be going to school or when was potty training going to actually succeed. Um, and so for that, it's been helpful in terms of giving some boundaries. Uh, I can't say that we can perfectly prognosticate these things, but giving some idea what to expect, 
more importantly, being able to identify some educational opportunities that are likely to be more effective, some things that might be more challenging and tied with that some things that might be more effective. Also helpful to identify some medical comorbidities. So in certain circumstances, there might be, for instance, epilepsy that someone wasn't recognizing. And being able to make that diagnosis, get it treated, get it under control, very, very helpful. One of the things that comes with genetics, as you might expect, is some families have this question about, is it going to happen again? Is it going to happen again to me? I want to have another child, or at least I've thought about having another child. Or in some cases, with our older individuals, it's their siblings that are actually getting ready to have kids now. And they're thinking, my brother Johnny had this challenge. Am I going to now? I'm thinking about having my children or getting married. Am I going to have a child with this as well? And so that information has been extremely helpful, because in some cases, when these changes are de novo, we can say, based Basically, it should not happen again. Very, very unlikely that happen again. This was lightning striking, um, but not going to be an issue. In other circumstances where we've seen this, where we know very clearly that it does have a 25% chance of happening again, and if individuals are concerned, they need not be, but if they're concerned about it, some measures that can be taken. And again, that's not necessarily that it has to be the case. One of the other things that we've realized is that um, People are actually collecting a lot of data, and this may be data that's useful in terms of being able to see what the real day-to-day -day impact is. Um, so when people come to see me in the doctor's office, for instance, I'm asking about things you know, like how they're growing, how their seizures are doing, um, but I can't sort of be in their heads to see what a day-to-day -day moment is like for them to really be in their shoes. And so we've tried to figure out ways of doing that in particular so that we could have very sensitive and robust measures to be able to see if there were improvements or things that got worse, to be able to monitor how things were doing. And that's been important for us, especially in terms of thinking about interventions. So if we were going to do something, whether it be a behavioral change, whether it be a medication change, we wanted some objective measures that were very sensitive to change to see this. So we've started working with things like one of the things I'm wearing, um, so a wearable like a Fitbit, or some of you may have some other device. Um, I don't know how obsessed you get about this. I mainly do this so I can compete with my son with number of steps that we take. Um, but for some of you, you may do it for other things, being able to monitor sleep, just as an example, and being able to see how sleep or how restful sleep is. Um, all kidding aside, where you go, whether or not you get out and about, is actually something that tells us how you're doing. For people that end up not taking many steps and staying at home in their room, um, it actually tells us in some terms of something about what's happening with sociability. So we're increasingly using things like this, things like our smartphones and devices, to be able to get much richer data and be able to use this as measures of outcome. For any of you that are uh, extremely sort of informatically based or computationally based, we're trying to figure out automated ways of doing speech analysis and understanding just how much speech they have, how much interaction, how much meaningful speech there is between individuals to measure social interactions, um, and the content of that. Um, and for any of you that work for the NSA, um, this is probably, they're the folks that have done a lot of the data science behind this and, and how we start to learn how to analyze data streams like this. Um, as Carrie's mom, Lynn, was saying, one of the things that we get out of doing the genetics, though, is that we start now, instead of having um, this sort of entire spectrum of individuals with autism, we can now have individuals that have really their own little communities with this. And it's been wonderful to see over time the ability to now bring these communities together and start to learn from each other. And as they do, um, I can just tell you it's a remarkable experience to see people physically get together for the first time in their lives, uh, look at pictures of each other, and be able to share share stories and realize how much there were similarities between those individuals and their families, and importantly, to be able to learn very quickly from each other, mostly on Facebook, I have to say, uh, but to learn very quickly from each other in terms of things that can be helpful. So we started a program to do this in a very organized way called Simon's Variation in Individuals Project, or Simon's VIP. And as we did that, we started out looking at just a few genes. But as the number of genes for autism has grown, so have the numbers grown in terms of this. And we now have communities internationally. Um, I can say on Saturday, I was spending uh, sort of online, but I was uh, in the Netherlands working with several of our families that, were, that are Dutch. Um, and we do the same thing. We can now, for very little cost, be able to have communities and community meetings, um, taking experts like me and putting us all over the world to be able to get in touch with families like that. So I want to show you just very briefly, one of the first ones that we studied was a region on chromosome 16. I won't bother going into all the details. Um, but there were some individuals who had, they were missing a copy of a chunk of genes on chromosome 16, and some other people that actually had an extra copy or a duplication. 
And interestingly, we brought those folks in and we looked at their brains very carefully and saw how it functioned, what their behaviors were like. And just in a very simple sense, the individuals who had deletions, if you take a tape measure and measure the size of their brains, they actually had larger brains, larger heads. Individuals with the duplication, kind of a mirror, just the opposite. They actually, if you took that same tape measure, had smaller head circumference, smaller brains, smaller heads. Um, so that was one just very obvious thing that we could see. We could also see some differences, again, in terms of the brain function. Their muscle tone was lower. We could see in terms of coordination, things like hitting a baseball, uh, other sports that they were doing. They were, had problems with being clumsy or, or not so coordinated, uh, problems in terms of epilepsy. And interestingly enough, for the deletion carriers, also problems where they started gaining a lot of weight during adolescence. So we started doing this in a very quantitative way. So we could do something like measuring intelligence quotient, or IQ. And I won't say that IQ is the end or all the be all, but it gives us a quantitative measure in terms of cognition. And in this case, what we did is we took the individual with the 16P deletion, and then we also took their family members without the deletion, mom, dad, siblings. And interestingly enough, for those of you that are mathematically oriented, IQ has a normal distribution. So an IQ, the average IQ in the population is 100. What we found out is that our study participants, they were smarter than average, if you will. They had an IQ of about 110 on average for these parents and, and children, other siblings that didn't have 16P. And when we looked at the individuals with 16P, we still saw this normal distribution, but instead we saw it shifted downward about 1.7 standard deviations. So again, within the context of these other genetic factors that they had from their family, that was determining exactly where they would land on that IQ scale. Wasn't just about IQ though, we can also do measures of autism that we call sociability or social responsiveness scale or SRS. In this particular case, a higher number means greater social impairments. And again, you can see the normal distribution of the siblings, of the parents, and then the shifting right of about 1.7 standard deviations for the individuals with 16P. And so I won't go into all the details, but we can now do this very, very robustly. So now that we have a single genetic form of autism, now we see that robustness, that reliability, that very quantitative way of being able to do this, it now is starting to make sense. And we can now, and we've done it, look at individuals even before they're born and be able to look how their brains grow, how they develop, look at the microstructure of the way the brain cells are connected, really be able to get in deeply now that we have single groups of these. Um, this is one of our genes that was identified only a couple years ago, and remarkable to me that e even though it's only a couple years old, we already have more than 100 people around the world. And the interesting thing about this and some other genes like this is every single person, even though they're genetically not related to each other, if they go on Ancestry.com, there's no common sort of Viking that you know was their original descendant, <laughs> even though they're all completely independent, they have the exact same change in Pax1 that has arisen over 100 times completely independently in all of those families. And so with that, we now have a very homogeneous group. And now, uh, as I said, other investigators are starting to, to work with these families to try and get answers and, and understand how the brain's different. In some genes, we see channels or little openings in cells that allow electricity or ions to flow through to make electricity. In a very interesting way for this one particular gene, if you end up having the channel open, you have problems with epilepsy. If the channel is open too much, it's one condition. If the channel is closed or you don't have that channel, it causes autism. And so again, depending on whether it's this way or this way, you still end up with brain changes, but different types of brain changes depending on exactly how that channel is working. So with this, we're still far to go on our journey. Uh, but one of the good things is we're starting to now be able to think about rationally based treatments, treatments based on what we know about the prognosis, about behavioral therapies, about things that are most likely to work for those individuals. Some because parents have just tried it by trial and error and we've learned in that way. Some because we actually understand now the molecular biology about fundamentally what's different about the way those brain cells are working. And although it's not gonna be an easy journey, I certainly think we've got many opportunities going forward. One of the things that's most exciting to me is not even the medicines that are available, but some of the technologies that are available. Some of the communication, assisted communication we can, devices we can use. When I grew up, we didn't have tablets, we didn't have smartphones, of course. But now, for individuals, they understand a huge amount of what's going on around them, but they simply have difficulty expressing this. And we can now be their mouths for them. We can be, their, be able to give them words to speak. The other thing that we've realized, I'm just gonna go forward relatively quickly. 
quickly here. The other thing, I'll skip over her in the interest of time. The other thing that I've realized, um, which is actually a different neurological condition, um, but I'll give it to you not because this is autism, but because I think it does uh, tell us some opportunities for the future. So I will distinctly use the past tense because I do think this is now in our history. The most common genetic cause of death for children under the first year of age was a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. It affects one in 10,000 babies born in the United States. And importantly, it is a degenerative disease. So these babies, when they're first born, look completely normal, but unfortunately the babies with type one SMA go downhill in terms of their muscles get weaker to the point that they can't breathe. Their breathing muscles give out on them and they die actually of respiratory failure. Within this condition, um, we had this idea though that we might need to be able to get in with treatment before we saw symptoms. That is because it's a degenerative condition and because it's associated with permanent loss of neurons called motor neurons, we had to start a treatment before we started losing those motor neurons. So there were different treatments that were thought about with this, um, and one now is FDA approved called nusinersen. There are others that we've thought about in terms of gene therapy. But as we did this, we had this somewhat radical idea that we would have to actually do population-based screening to be able to identify those babies before they were, exactly before they were symptomatic, be able to get in and start the treatment to be able to preserve health and preserve life. So we did a pilot under my direction in New York State where we used the newborn screen blood spots. So when your babies are born, they get a heel prick. We check for things like phenylketonuria, and we decided with that, we're going to take just a little drop of blood from that, extract the DNA, and see who's going to have spinal muscular atrophy if families would want to do that. When we did that, more than 95% of families said, in fact, that's a good idea, sign us up. And as we did that, this was starting in January 2016. This was our first little girl that we identified in New York State. She was predicted to have infantile or type one spinal muscular atrophy. Oops. She started instead by two weeks of life uh, on nusinersen, a medication that was used to treat spinal muscular atrophy. And these are her first steps at 14 months of age. She's now two and a half years old. She is strong as a horse, completely normal development, has never been in the hospital, has never had any respiratory problems, otherwise would have been six feet under by this point in her life. And the exciting part for this is not only is nusinersen an option now, um, but the first trials of gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy are showing remarkable success. And that gene therapy is a peripheral infusion for this adeno-associated virus. It is theoretically a one-and-done treatment. So one time where you could be able to give back this gene that's missing, be able to identify those babies before they're symptomatic, and set them up for a lifetime of health. I don't know where this is going for autism. I'm not making any promises, but I used to think at the beginning of my career that this was going to be extremely difficult, and this is one of our first most successful neurological cases to show us that there are possibilities to make this happen. So with this, it makes me think even more I've got to be able to figure out the genes, because to be able to do something like a molecularly based treatment to gene therapy, I have to know what the gene is for the individual people to be able to help with that. I want to be very clear, though. Again, autism is a very wide spectrum. Not everyone is looking for a treatment like this, but there are some individuals who are, and for those, we'd like to be able to support those families. So we still have a long way to go, um, but I think we've made tremendous progress, at least in the last decade, and I feel us accelerating as we're going forward. So I hope we've got bright opportunities in the future. I just want to say that I get the luxury of being able to speak with you, but really it's a large team that makes all of this happen. And I just want to thank, importantly, all the families who've contributed to this most importantly, but also the people behind the scenes who make this happen every day. So I'll be glad to stop and we can take some questions.